Hello and welcome to another episode of The Exchange. The topic of refugees is constantly in the media and on today's show we are going to look at the human side of this issue. Have we depersonalised refugees and forgotten that behind every story is a person? The refugee problem in Australia gets a lot of attention. What a lot of people don't realise is it's not illegal to seek asylum in Australia, even if arriving by boat. In 2010, 6,879 refugees arrived in Australia. None of them terrorists. None of them claiming Centrelink benefits. So why all the attention? Do we see refugees as problems and not people? On the show today, we're joined by Julian Burnside, who is a QC and also an officer of the Order of Australia for his service as a human rights advocate. Welcome, Julian. Great to have you with us. It certainly is. We're also joined by David Newell Vincent, who has an incredible story of survival, having been trained as a child soldier in Ethiopia. He is now an advocate for refugees in the Sudanese community and is a Victorian human rights youth ambassador and a People of Australia ambassador. Welcome, David. Looking forward to your story. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to uh, hear some of your story. David, tell us about your experiences in southern Sudan. As I sit here today, um, I feel like I'm dreaming. And if I am dreaming, I would wish to keep dreaming because I don't want to wake up and find myself in a refugee camp again. But my story as a war child, as a refugee child, began when I was eight years old, when I knew little about what was happening around me. My father just said, David, we have to leave. The sad part of it was just standing there and while we were leaving, my mother gave me a big hug and I looked back for the last time and she was standing there and she was crying. Now, probably she knows a little bit more of what was happening or what was going to be ahead of me. But I, as an 80 year old, I didn't know. And that's how my journey started. And I ended up walking for about three months with my father. We ended up in Ethiopia. Wow. And short days later, my father was also removed and the likes of my father, the adults were taken away. And here we were, hundreds and hundreds of boys alone just to fend for themselves. So you were mm. all on your own in regard to there were no other family members with you at that point, just you and a lot of other young boys, eight, nine years old? Eight, of age. nine years, and the oldest probably were about 12 years old, and uh, that was around um, 86 and 87, 1986, 87. So it was, it was pretty much. So here we were um, as an 80 year old. What do you do? You know, then we have to switch into survival mode, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Mm. Julian, what about your journey into being a human rights advocate? Yeah, it was sort of partly accidental, um, but I, uh, I came across an Iranian family, mum and dad and two daughters, who'd come from Iran in terrible circumstances. They were locked up in Woomera Detention Centre. Uh, and the, after about 15 months, the 10-year-old especially was doing it very tough. Everyone does it tough in detention, but the 10-year-old was really in a bad way. A psychiatrist uh, delivered a report to the immigration department saying this kid had completely given up, she was at extreme risk and the family should be moved to a metropolitan detention centre so she could get daily clinical help. Mm. And after two reports like that and months and months of delay, the department eventually moved the family to Maribyrnong Detention Centre in the western suburbs of Melbourne. Although the reason for moving them was that the ten-year-old girl needed daily clinical help. For the first two and a half weeks of their stay in Maribyrnong, no one came to see her. No one at all. And on a Sunday night in May of 2002, while her mum and dad and her young sister were off having their dinner, this little girl, alone in their cell, got a bed sheet and hanged herself. Oh, shocking. But she was still strangling when the family came back. She was taken down. She and her mother were taken to the general hospital nearby. She was placed in intensive care with two ACM guards at the door so that as a matter of law they were still in immigration detention. Con from the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre, who'd been looking after their uh, visa application, heard about this, went to the hospital about nine o'clock that night, said good day to the guards who know him because he's a regular visitor at mm. Narrabinong, and he said, oh, look, I just want to speak to the mother and see if there's anything I can do to help. 
and the guard said, no, you can't see them because lawyers visiting ours in immigration detention are nine to five and they sent him away. And he then rang me at home and told me what had happened. And to this day, you know, 12 years later, I still cannot get over the horror of thinking that anyone could treat a 10 year old girl so harshly that she would try and kill herself and then they would turn away someone Some offering help. decent human help. Yeah. It, it's just... And, it. and, and I decided then and there uh, mm. that I would do whatever I have to do for as long as I have to do it to try and get Australia back on track as being the decent country that I believe it is. And to, to hear that ha about that happening in another country is one thing. To hear that about that happening here yes. is... is, is mm. phew, it's... Mind-blowing, isn't mind -blowing. it? Mind-blowing. Yeah. 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 David, what was it like for you when you first came to Australia? Now, uh, I guess what helped is uh, I didn't know anything about Australia, so I didn't have a greater deal of expectations. But one thing I knew for sure, and as many refugees as they take the journey to resettle in a new country, is that I knew I would be able to sleep soundly without hearing a gunshot. I knew I would be able to feed. I knew I would be able to do things that I never had a chance to do them while I was in a refugee camp. Mm. So with that expectation, I think uh, I was able to go through some of the uh, learnings, the early learnings. And of course, as a refugee, when you arrive, you have to learn everything from cooking to whatever you do, even just catching a bus or a train or a tram, it's constantly learning, these things are new. Mm. And I guess uh, a lot of people out there would not know that these, we are struggling when we first arrive. Yeah. 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 How, did, how did you get here, by the way? I, um, after I waited in a camp, in a second camp, because I was in two different camps, uh, the second one was in, in, in Kenya, northern part of Kenya, a, a camp called Kakuma Refugee Camp. There was over 80,000 people there. And after 12 years, luckily that day when I was uh, told that you are coming to Australia, I was, I was thrilled. You know, it, was, yeah. it was a great moment. So I arrived uh, in Australia just about nine years ago. So Julian, tell us some of the reasons that you have discovered that people actually, why they're seeking an asylum in the first place. I think some of us have some idea, but what are some of the things that you've found? Well, the, the people who come here as boat people have typically come down the corridor from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan or Pakistan down through Malaysia and Indonesia. And interestingly, none of those countries are signatories to the Refugees Convention. None of them offer safety to people who uh, pass through their territory. Um, over the last 14 years or so, about more than 50% of the people who come that way have been Hazaras fleeing Afghanistan. Now. You know, I don't think it's controversial that to be a Hazara uh, fleeing Afghanistan or now Pakistan uh, these days is equivalent to Jews fleeing G Germany in the 1930s. You know, yeah. they are unquestionably the subject of persecution. And in fact, more than 99% of Hazaras over the last 14 years have been accepted as genuine refugees. Mm. Interesting, more than 90% of all boat people over the last 14 years have been accepted as genuine refugees because we know the boat trip is dangerous and uh, you've got to be pretty serious about escaping if you're going to risk your life at sea. Yes. It's not a lifestyle mm. thing, you know? No, no. that's right. Um, yeah. And that's a misconception that uh, that is a lifestyle thing. I mean, David, you know, how would you respond to someone who says, you know, you just came here for a, a better life? You came here for a life, really. Well, look, if I... For us, we have to risk a life for a better life. Mm. And it doesn't matter how dangerous it is, but then at the end, you hope that at the end you will be able to, to have a better life. And mm. that's why some of refugees decide to jump on a boat, for instance. They know that they can lose their life. But the beauty of it is that at the end of the day, you are risking your life and hoping that I will arrive and at least I will be given a second chance. Mm. And perhaps that's what the public doesn't really understand, how difficult it is for a baby, for a mother to, to get into that boat with a, with a child. It's, it's, it's terrible. Terrifying. And I think, yes, it's very terrifying. And, and, and I, I think we just have to connect on that level as humans rather than looking at it uh, differently. Yeah, looking Good at point. the people. Mm. Julian, why do you think Australian laws uh, governing asylum seekers, refugees, are so strict? Uh, look, I think it's an accident of, uh, of history and of political um, opportunism. The, uh, the, the touchstone for the recent bout of anti-refugee hysteria was the Tampa episode in 2001. Now, um, 
the John, John Howard did the Tampa thing specifically for uh, uh, political reasons. You know, he was he had uh, members of his party who were concerned about leakage to the uh, One Nation uh, side, and he took a stand on Tampa because he figured that would draw back some people from One Nation. Um, now, uh, Kim Beasley, who was leader of the opposition then, might have been able to take a different tack and opposed it and contradicted the dishonesty like they're illegals, they're queue jumpers, all that stuff that works well but it's false. Yep. Um, but he didn't. He was, he was um, snookered by history because two weeks after Tampa, 9-11 happened. Mm. Yeah. And, and so Beasley made common cause with Howard and the Labor Party had been compromised on the issue ever since. Yeah. Mm. And so 9-11 was kind of proof that what we did with Tampa was right. It, well, it was completely unrelated to it. But, yes. But the public image the was all boat people are Muslims and after 9-11 yep. all Muslims are terrorists. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Crazy. Great, great discussion. We'll be back with more and Street Talk right after this. any concerns about refugees living in Australia? I think they should be welcomed. I feel we should embrace them in, if they're having, you know, obviously issues. They've come here for a reason and because it's a great country. Not really. No, I don't think so. I don't have concerns with refugees as long as they're here legally. They find their country um, too dangerous or too frightening and they need somewhere to take refuge. I don't think we should turn them away. Not really. If they're obviously um, integrated by the right people um, and they are introduced to the way of life of Australians, and of course you can keep your own culture, I'm of Lebanese descent, I, I feel that I'm both Lebanese and Australian. No, not at all, um, as long as they do it through the correct ch channels. The more I hear of it, the more tragic it is, the more disgusting it is, and it makes me feel very, very sorry that I was born in this country. And if you were to seek asylum, what would you expect from a government? Open arms, really. If you're coming from a devastated area, horrible area you don't want to live in, it'd be pretty devastating coming to a country and being shut out. Just the support of... They're not just coming here for no reason. There's obviously a real issues that are going on and they're coming to somewhere that is a lot safer and you'd want them to be understanding and to uh, support those people who are having a terrible time in their home country. An easy pathway or the right pathway into whatever country it is I'm going to? Fairness, um, especially when you have such a rich country as Australia, you expect the government to treat you at least fairly and to give you a chance. And if you were seeking asylum, what would you expect a government to give you? <laughs> Bugger all, actually. <laughs> I would say it'd be down to me. You know, people who are who, seeking asylum have probably come from somewhere where they've got nothing and they come here for a chance. So my view is if you just give them the, give them the chance, that's more than enough. Welcome back. We're discussing whether society has depersonalised refugees with QC Julian Burnside and refugee advocate David Newell Vincent and Sandra, our Street Talk reporter. Welcome. Hi, Rob. Hi, Christy. Hi. The people you talked to seemed very reasonable. They were. They were. Um, if anything, I've found quite a lot of compassion uh, on the streets. Was that a surprise? To you? Yeah, there were. It was a surprise, but I think there's still some misconceptions about the fact that um, there's an illegal way of entering this yeah. country, which, you know, that's, I think, got to do with the way we reported in the media that if a, a person comes by boat here, then that's illegal, and it's, and it's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, what would you say to that, Julian? I... Well, first of all, I agree. I was not too surprised to hear those reactions because I think most Australians are pretty decent people. Um, the politicians who lead us, maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, because they have deceived the public comprehensively about boat people. You know, I mean, the, the irony is people who come here seeking asylum by aeroplane, they come in with a visa for tourism or study or whatever, um, they're never put into detention. About 20% of them make a grade ultimately as genuine refugees. Boat people, 
in about 90% of cases, turn out to be genuine refugees legally entitled to our protection and we lock them up and we lock them up indefinitely and we mistreat them so badly that they try and kill themselves, that they mm. decide to go back and face the Taliban instead of facing Australia. And don't forget, the last election, the September th uh, 2013 election, we had both major parties trying to outdo each other in their yes. promises of cruelty yes. to a particular group of human beings. It's like, how that, low can we go? Yeah, how and low can we yeah. Go? that older lady, she said she thought it was disgraceful, and I mm. thought that was a very strong comment mm. and, and appropriate comment. Mm. And from what you've been telling us, uh, certainly that's the case. And there seems to be this disconnect between what people are wanting and, be and, and, and believe that this country is a fair country and that we are a rich country mm. and can provide hospitality to others but a disconnect with government. And I don't know if that's how you found it, David, uh, in coming here. Um, look, Australia is a, is a fair and a great country. Now, what I just possibly can't understand is that why are we leaving these issues to politicians to decide for us? Look at what people say on the street. For me, when we leave it to the politicians, then they will talk about refugees and asylum seekers in terms of policies. Who've got the best policy that we could vote for? But I guess what we want to do is that let's talk about these issues as human beings. And that's where yes. we'll get closer to the solution. But this is where we feel that the media has possibly not represented the people on the street. Like you said, Julian, the politicians are, are leading the charge on this. Because they can see some votes in, in making the public feel frightened about people and then taking strong measures to protect the people from that threat. Mm. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a great con trick. Mm. But uh, it was being said a long time ago that if you make the public fear someone and then protect them from that person, you will win. You're the so good it's guy. ultimately yeah. all about winning power? It's about winning or maintaining power. And using opinion. people in horrendous situations for your cause. Mm. Is there a country that's leading well in this area? Canada is doing well. Sweden is doing well. Um, what do no, you say they're doing well? What are they doing well? Well, they don't lock people up. You know, we're the only, we're the only Western country that locks up asylum seekers indefinitely. Uh, we're the only country that's, come, that's done something as terrible as the Pacific Solution, where people get thrown into a hellhole for the specific purpose of deterring both people. So, you so know, I mean, think about the policy of deterrence. A deterrent is something that makes you choose this course rather than the alternative. Yes. Mm. So what our government is trying to do now is to make coming to Australia look uglier than facing the Taliban or facing the Rajapaksa regime or facing the, the theocrats in Iran. We're trying to make ourselves look so bad that people will not want to come here to protect and themselves. And we seem like we're succeeding. Seems like we're succeeding, but what a, what a price to pay yes. for, a, for what, what a is tawdry being, victory. What is yeah. being done? I mean, we're dealing with people who are traumatised, who've seen, who are displaced, like David's story, who are seeing, you know, family members um, murdered in front of them, etc. What are we doing to uh, make, is there anything in place to even consider stopping locking these people up who are in this situation? It's um, At the moment, no. At the moment it's getting worse and worse. I mean the Pacific Solution is all about mistreating people so that the risk of drowning isn't enough to deter you. Well then we'll, we'll add a few other nasty bits on top. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think Australia needs to stand back, take a deep breath. Consider the fact that you could actually treat asylum seekers decently and it would cost the country about $500 million a year. Uh, what we're doing at the moment, mistreating them, costs us $5 billion a year. We're going to come back mm. in just a moment and uh, talk about what some of the possible positive solutions can be. Sandra, thanks for popping in. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back with more in just a moment on The Exchange. <music> Welcome back. We're discussing if society has depersonalised refugees. Some very insightful but challenging comments from Julian and David. Yes, indeed. David, um, your hopes for Australia and the way we deal with asylum seekers, what would you like to see? Well, look, if you give um, asylum seeker or refugee a chance, a second chance, they make life for themselves and they work in betterment of their communities, either here or back home. And I think my hope is that Australia would be able to understand 
as to why these people or why we leave our countries and come and seek refuge here. And perhaps in a way people would understand and open, uh, open the doors and, 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 and let us in. And then you see what happens. We become a contributing members of this society as well. So we, we don't come and live in isolation. We become part of this community. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've obviously, in fact, you talked earlier about integrating, you know, learning our culture and ways and all of that kind of thing. And we become very proud Australian as well at yep. the end of the day. Yeah. And I think that need to be uh, factored in as well, that at the end, we just don't come and live in a vacuum. We come and blend in in the society. Yeah, and Julian, what concrete things would you like to see uh, Australians moving towards to uh, bring some resolution to this drastic situation that we're in? Well, I think there's a fairly straightforward solution to it. Uh, I don't advocate open borders, OK? So I would say let's accept the f reality that the danger of the boat trip is a natural filter. Yes. But if people arrive here by boat, then, sure, detain them initially for preliminary health and security checks. That's a reasonable precaution. But cap that at one month. No more than one month unless a court orders in a particular case that someone should be held longer. Uh, but then at the end of the one month, pending refugee status determination, interim visas with four conditions. One, they've got to stay in touch with the department, so they can't just disappear. Two, uh, they're allowed to work. Three, they're allowed access to Medicare and Centrelink benefits. Four, they must live in a specified regional town or city until their refugee status is decided. Now, when you think about it, whether they get jobs or whether they stay on Centrelink, the money they spend will be spent in the ailing economy of regional towns. And there are lots of regional towns that are suffering because their populations are slowly drifting to the coastal capitals. Yes. Um, I worked out that on the worst, on the worst assumptions about arrival rates and, and so on, it would cost Australia no more than $500 million a year to run this, and at the moment we're spending $5 billion to do it. But of course, if you do it this way, it's going to benefit the country towns, it's going to benefit the refugees, it's going to benefit the community because these people will be grateful for the yes. way we've treated them. Uh, and they won't be damaged by the way we've treated them. And Australians who are known for their good nature and helping people and, uh, you know, would actually be shown for who they are as opposed to this yeah. situation that we're in at the moment. Yeah, that's right. I think our government's treatment of asylum seekers misrepresents Australia terribly. And it's really interesting, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember the uh, the Springboks demonstrations in 1971 when the Springboks rugby team from South Africa came here and everyone was protesting because South Africa was so terrible on human rights. Well, I had dinner with a South African judge last year and he said, what are you people doing? Your human rights record is terrible. <laughs> Maybe they should be uh, protesting against Australia in yeah. South Africa yeah. now. <laughs> and David, you're, you've obviously got an amazing story that has a, has a happy ending. You still have family back in Africa? Yes, I do. So after 22 years, I was able to uh, connect again with my mother. And my father also survived the war. So it's great. I have my family back in South Sudan now. And you're keeping in touch with um, them. We're and keeping in touch with them. So it has a happy ending. It and is. obviously you're working as well, helping us uh, all here in Australia get to know the person behind the issue, exactly. as it were. Sharing so David the story. And Julian, yeah. we really appreciate your time today. Yes. Um, we would encourage um, all of our viewers, if you feel passionately about this, maybe write to your local MP and, uh, and voice your uh, opinion and your concern. Don't forget you can go to our fact sheet for more information about how you could uh, make a difference with this, with this issue and really think these things through. Thank you for joining us today on The Exchange. We look forward to your company next time. Bye for now.